thank you for having me here today. It's very exciting to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the work I've been doing on um, a class of objects called variable stars, and why I think, and tell you about why I think these um, are one of the most interesting things in, about our universe. So here's a picture that was taken using the Hubble Space Telescope, and this was taken by stack by um, using a very long exposure technique. Um, basically, they pointed the telescope. Uh, um, what, they, what looks like an empty patch of sky and um, over a period of around 22 days. So this is what like when you take a long exposure photograph with your camera, but instead of leaving the shutter open for like a matter of minutes or hours, this is like leaving the shutter open for 22 days. It might just imagine that in your head. What if I left my camera's shutter open for 22 days? And rather than seeing the patch of empty sky um, that, that you would normally see that when you just looked up at that, here we see um, 5,500 galaxies, over 5,000 galaxies. Now when you look at that, you see these wonderful galaxies, but you don't really see much happening. You've just got these galaxies, and they're just kind of sat there. But what's... What I think is fascinating about the universe is that there's stuff happening all the time. And I don't just mean on the scale of things happening on Earth and things changing on Earth. There's things changing in space all the time. Stars are exploding. Galaxies are moving around. And stars are moving within galaxies. But the thing that I work on is stars pulsating. So stars themselves are getting bigger and smaller and changing in brightness. And this, is, this shows you what I mean. The, the universe is dynamic. So this is a video um, made with the Hubble Space Telescope with um, photographs taken over a period of, of weeks. So this is one of the stars that I work on. And when you put these photographs together, kind of like a time lapse, what you can see is this star is pulsating and it's changing in brightness. And here you can see the, the star getting brighter and fainter. And those, um, those changes in brightness are, are going out through, the, through space and it's lighting up the dust around the star. And those, what we see is in these ripples in the dust lighting up, and we call those light echoes. And these, and this, these changes in brightness are what I study. And we can use those to work out lots of different things about the universe and the shapes of galaxies. Now these stars were first studied um, by a man called John Goodrick, um, who was an astronomer in York. And it was first discovered by a British astronomer. And he, what he did um, was he went out and observed these, um, these stars called um, Cephids. He went out every night and looked at these stars and he did astronomy in a very different way to what we do today. So we didn't have things like digital cameras in, in, the, in the 18th century. He had to go out and look at these stars with his telescope and say, well that one, it kind of looks a bit fainter than the one next to it, but it looks a bit brighter than that one, and maybe about the same as that one. And he had to do this painstaking process for all, over and over again hundreds and hundreds of times. And he did this over, over months and months. And eventually he wrote this letter to the Royal Astronomical Society, describing in, in huge detail how, how this star, Delta Cephei, changed in brightness. And he managed to determine the shape of this change in brightness of the star to such, to such accuracy that he determined how fast it was changing. Um, almost exactly how, how fast the change is to what we know it is today. He, he did it to such a high precision. Now the unfortunate thing is that, well, he was working in York, where the weather is pretty similar to what it is here today. And because of his obsession with this star, he, and he was going out in the middle of the night in the cold and the rain, he eventually caught pneumonia and he died. So, he died from astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> I 
which is which is a bit of a shame, really. Um, it's it's also one of the things that has inspired me to leave Leeds and go and work in Pasadena in California <laughs> to work on these stars. So let let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> um, yeah. So one of the other heroes of variable star astronomy is Henrietta Leavitt, and she's one of my personal heroes. Um, Henrietta Leavitt was another person who put a lot of painstaking work into studying variable stars. She was studying a galaxy called the Small Magellanic Cloud. Now, at the time, we didn't actually know it was another galaxy. Um, we, she was just studying this population of stars. Um, but she, she studied these stars, and she was looking at how their, their brightness has changed, and she, she drew this graph on the left-hand side here, and she noticed that these, their period changed and their brightness has changed. And she wrote this fundamental thing in this paper. She wrote, the brighter variables have longer periods. And that's actually one of the most fundamental things we've ever discovered in astronomy. <coughs> It was so fundamental that I use it in my research every single day. This is something that we still use to this day. And it was known for almost 100 years as the Cepheid period luminosity relation. The reason it was known as that is that Henrietta Leavitt had the misfortune of being born as a woman in the, um, in the late 19th century and working in a male-dominated field. If she had been a man working in this field, this would have been named after her. And this paper, you know, Pickering 1912, would have immediately been Levitt 1912. But because she was a woman working in a male-dominated field, it was written under somebody else's name. It was written under the name of her boss. Now, a few years ago, astronomers finally came around to the idea that maybe she should be, be given credit for her own work. And there was a resolution through the American Astronomical Society and the International Astronomical Union to finally get her the credit she deserved for this fundamental piece of work. And now if you read any, any paper about this, written since then, it's referred to as the Levitt Law, to give her the full credit she was due. And, that, and actually now as well, the citation has been changed to, say, to give her the full credit, so it's now cited the Levitt and Pickering. Now the reason I say that this is a fundamental piece of work is that if we know the period of these stars, if we know the, the rate at the, which they're pulsating, the period, that means we can work out how bright they are, because they're directly related. And that's actually a very fundamental thing that you're probably doing all the time, because if you know how bright something is, how bright something really is, you can work out how far away it is. And you're doing science like that all the time, and you just don't even think about it. But it's something your brain does all the time. So say you took this light bulb, um, and it had, like, say, 10 watts now, because we have energy-saving light bulbs that aren't 100 watts all the time. But say I had it hold it close to you, and then I moved it further away, it would get fainter, and it would get smaller but it would still be a 10 watt light bulb. But because it was fainter and smaller, you, could, you would know instinctively that it was further away. And you could work, your brain would work that out. It could give an estimate of how far it is away. And that, and that thought was kind of succinctly put together, I think, most famously by the, by the philosopher, Father Ted Crilly, <laughs> who said, these cows are small, but those ones are far away. And, that's kind of what your brain is doing all the time. It's saying, this, this thing is a small thing, and that thing's a far away thing, that thing's big. And... But you're, you're doing that all the time in your head. Is this, a, is this thing close to me, or is it far away? And this is the kind of thing we're trying to do in astronomy all the time. What's happening on, on distant scales? Now, the reason this is important, I think, is because of the way that astronomy is done. It's a very different science to a lot of other ones. So for sciences like chemistry or, or biology, you can often design an experiment in, in the lab where I, you can 
bring in materials or tools. But in astronomy, we can't do that. We have one universe and we're in one fixed position and we can't change what we're doing. So I think this, this kind of illustrates it quite well. You take this piece of artwork and if you're at one position in the room, this is what you get to look at. You get this picture of an eye. But if you moved around in the room, you would see that this isn't a picture of an eye. It's a 3D sculpture made up of all these different balls. And this, all you did was move your position here. And now you can see if you were in lots of different positions, you'd see a completely different sculpture. And you'd see all these different sizes and different shapes just from moving your position. And in astronomy, we don't have that luxury. We, we're fixed. We can't pick up the Earth and move it. We can't pick up the different galaxies and move them. All we can do is use the information we can derive about, about the, the positions of the stars from us and their brightnesses. Well, that's all we can do is infer. And that's why being able to determine a star's distance is so important to us. Now, I said before um, that Henriette Levitt was working on stars in the Small Magellanic Cloud. And this is a picture of the Small Magellanic Cloud. I include it here because it's pretty. Um, that's it. <laughs> um, it's also this galaxy on the scarf. Um, but since then, we've, we've, we've continued to study the Small Magellanic Cloud. It's a galaxy that I work on myself, using the same stars that Henrietta worked on. Now imagine, rather than just studying them as one population, we could, we could break that down in the same way that you could with the, with the eye, and try and look at what the different structure is. And that's what we did here. So now we've got this exact same star she was looking at, but color-coded by distance. So the red stars are far away, and the blue stars are close to you. So this picture on the left, bottom left here is how the galaxy looks to you if you just look <coughs> at it on the sky. But if you could go and look and fly up over the top of the galaxy, then this picture on the left hand, going along the left-hand side that's how the galaxy would look to you, if you could fly <coughs> along the top. Or on the, if you could fly along the side, that's how it would look along the bottom. Along the, bottom. the galaxy would appear really elongated, like a sausage. So this is how the galaxy actually looks once you can move yourself around. And we derive that by looking at the individual distances of the stars. So here now we've got two galaxies. The, ga the small Magellanic Cloud is actually part of a pair of galaxies, the large cloud and the small cloud. And on the left we have the large cloud, and the right we have the small cloud. So you can see now why it's called the small cloud, smaller than the large cloud. I feel like I'm saying these words, and I'm like, yeah, they're obvious. <laughs> but actually, if you, could fly, uh, uh, if you could fly around and fly along the top, now it's not so obvious why the small cloud is the small cloud, because it's, hu it's hugely elongated compared to the large cloud. Look, and the reason for that is because we think, from, from doing work like this, we think that the galaxies actually smashed together a few hundred million years ago, which in astronomical terms is not that long ago. <laughs> um, we think that they actually smashed together, and this ripped apart the small cloud and that they, they actually they, they had a direct collision. Now if you could fly again around again and look at them from a different perspective, if this was the only perspective you ever got of these galaxies, would you even know that there were two of them? Or would you think it was, they were one? Now for a lot of galaxies, this is the only view we ever get. We only ever see this one view. And that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. Because for some galaxies, we might think we're seeing one galaxy, but we're actually seeing two, and we can't change our position, and we can't do this kind of work. So what are we misunderstanding about the universe? So that's why we do this kind of work, is to try and understand what's really happening. Now one of the words I've used quite a lot so far is galaxy, um, where I said at the start that this has um, over 5,000 galaxies in just this tiny image. And I say tiny, 
This is blown up really big, but it's actually only a very tiny patch of sky. And, but before Henrietta Levy did her work, we didn't actually know that there were other galaxies in the universe. <coughs> we thought these were clouds. Clouds out in space, not clouds just in the sky. And the first galaxies weren't actually discovered until less than a century ago. So this guy on the right here is Edwin Hubble. And this picture here is a photograph he took with a telescope um, of, of the Andromeda galaxy, what we now know as a galaxy. But at the time, he didn't know that. But using Henrietta Leavitt's work, and he identified Cephids in this galaxy, and he used her period, her period luminosity relation, the Leavitt law, to determine that the distance to this object must mean that it's so far beyond our own galaxy, it must be its own structure. And that understanding helped us to get that there must be something outside our own galaxy, and these things must be their own separate things. These must be other galaxies. And that was such a huge shift in our understanding of the universe. It completely changed how we thought of ourselves as, as a galaxy, and how we thought of our, ourselves in the universe. And that was all down to Henrietta Leavitt's work. Obviously, we have to give him some credit. <laughs> but, and people did give him some credit. I mean, they, they gave him a space telescope. <laughs> um, so this is the Hubble Space Telescope, um, which is, what, is an amazing piece of equipment. It's, it was its 25th birthday last year. Um, it's probably older than many of you in this room. Um, but, and it's done amazing things. But if you, and just think back to that grainy photograph, which at the time was the best thing we'd ever seen of Andromeda. Now this is the best picture we ever have of Andromeda. And this is just half of that galaxy. This is the biggest digital image ever made. This is a picture of Andromeda you made by stitching together individual photos from Hubble, just like you do with a panorama on your iPhone or something, and then putting them all together to make this one huge picture. And when you print this out, it fills up an entire corridor. And, and they have. <laughs> it's, it has a picture stood next to it. And it has its own Twitter account, and it tweets a little section like, every so often. And so you can just go and see what's in Andromeda. But studies like this allow us to discover new, like, whole new types of objects and study these galaxies in detail so we can understand what's going on with the, with the structure of Andromeda and discover whole, things in whole new realms of detail that we couldn't do before. Um, so that's where we're at so far. That's what we're doing right now with pieces of equipment that are 25 years old. But where we're going next, I think, is more exciting, because that's, that's what people like you are going to be working on next. Um, and this is one of the most exciting things, I think, that's coming up. It's um, LSST. And this is a, a, a new telescope that's, going to be, that's currently being built in Chile, um, but it's an international collaboration that the UK is part of. Now, LSST is, is a large telescope, but it's going to scan the sky in the southern hemisphere every few nights. Um, and what I think is the coolest part about this is this is a scale model of the camera. So this is a digital camera that's like, like the one that's in your phone, but this has three, over three billion pixels. So your, your camera in your phone probably has something like 12 megapixels. This has a million times more pixels in it than the one in your phone. And it's going to take a photo of the sky every few minutes. So we're going to have huge amounts of, of photos of the sky all the time with this. So we're going to be able to discover classes of objects that we didn't even know existed. We haven't thought of them yet. And that's the kind of thing that's going to be discovered with this. And then we have new telescopes that we're going to come on sky in the next um, few years. And things like the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to launch next year. 
and that's really exciting because it's going to look in the infrared and so it can look through dust where with telescopes that see with the same light as your eyes dust hides a lot of the light so stuff that's invisible with the with, with, vis with optical light you can see through with infrared light and this one on the bottom the European extremely large telescope that's going to be built on the ground but the mirror for that is going to be 40 meters wide so bigger than this room just one mirror so we can see further than we've ever been able to see before with that so it's what we've done so far is amazing but what we've done what we're going to do in the future i can't tell you because we haven't thought of it yet so that's kind of exciting so um thank you very much yeah. <laughs>